Today we're going to do a little review. Let's get to the word. We're going to start by reading verses 1 to 6 of the 8th chapter of Hebrews. But what this is really going to be this morning is a review of some of what we've learned already, working our way through the book of Hebrews. So this morning, allow me to read for you the first six verses of the 8th chapter of Hebrews. He starts out by saying, the point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle, set up by the Lord, not by man. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already men who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build a tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator, is superior to the one, and it is founded on better promises. Let's speak to the Lord for a moment, if we may. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning again for your word. We believe not only is it the revealed truth of yourself, but we believe that the application that you gave then is as good and fresh and relevant today as it ever was. Allow your word to speak to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, In in doing the review this morning, I just want you to know that sometimes we get bogged down with some of this stuff that's foreign to us. It really is. Why why do we need to know about Melchizedek? What's the importance of understanding about a high priest today? Why do we need to understand some of these things? How does it apply to my life when I'm sitting at a traffic light in Stillwater Avenue in Bangor waiting for the silly thing to change or I'm waiting to go in and get a flu shot at Rite Aid or whatever I might be doing in my life or if the refrigerator breaks down in the middle of the, the day and I need a new refrigerator, well, how does this apply to my life? Well, it applies in the, the thought that everything Everything in our lives revolves around who God is. He is the center of our lives. And in understanding how he's the center of our lives, it's important to understand the role that Jesus Christ played, is playing, and is preparing. Do you get that? Past, present, future. What's Jesus doing for you now? And I think that's the most important thing in our lives is understanding that God is a he's alive and he's well and he cares about our lives he cares whether the microwave all of a sudden isn't working or that we get a flat tire in the middle of the road on a slushy wintry night and now we're stuck with that he cares about us and I think if we continually bring ourselves to him because we understand his care for us It's what brings us closer and allows him to work in our lives. This morning, I'd like to go back over a couple of things. And the first question I'd like to ask you, this is not a test where you have to raise your hand, but we're going to review what is the most important point made so far in this epistle? And and as we've been reading this book, what in your mind has been the most important part of what we've learned so far from this book, the book of Hebrews? Now, if I had a class and you were taking the class and you wrote answers, I would hope to see the answer that says that we have an eternal, that we have an eternal high priest who is sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. We don't have a priest that is still working at the temple. We're not under the Jewish system. Remember that to to come close to God, we would have to come to the temple. We would have to come close to him. We would have to make 
good on our sin, and we'd have to come and atone for it. And the atonement was made, interceded for us by the priest. We don't have to do that anymore. What do you and I do on a Sunday morning? We come to worship a risen Savior. We come to worship the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. We come to worship Jesus. Andre Krauss used to, and I love it, he used to bang that piano back, and I'm going back a lot of years already, 40 years or more, and he'd, he'd yell out, there's power in the name of Jesus. There's healing in the name of Jesus. There's life in the name of Jesus. It's a Jesus thing. I keep preaching that. It's about Christ. And without Jesus, our lives mean very little. Nothing. And there's an irony in that because God loves you. He loves each and every one of us. He loves us so much that he says that he knew us before the world was created. And yet so many times in our lives we spur that. And we go the other way. And the writer of Hebrews so richly is saying, hey guys, bring it back to Jesus. Understand what he did, what he's doing, and what he's preparing for us. So we need to say to ourselves, this is the most important part of the book so far. It's focusing our minds on Jesus. That he's our high priest. He's above everything that was established before. Those things which are just shadows of the things to come. Second question I'd like to ask this morning is what is significant about Christ being seated at the right hand of God? In fact, if you want to, uh, I'm going to do something I'm not usually in the custom of doing with you. I'd ask you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 10, and we'll look at verses 11 and 12. Hebrews 10, and verses 11 and 12. The question again is, what is significant about Christ being seated at the right hand of God? And these verses gives us the answer. Day after day, verse 11 says, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin or sins. But when this priest, and who are we talking about? Christ Jesus. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. He's there interceding for us because he paid. Remember, I, I like to use the analogy. It isn't a good one. I know that. But it's like when you go to the fair and they have that special, you pay one price, and the kiddies can get on all the rides by wearing the little bracelet. One price, we used to call it pop, pay one price. That's what Jesus did. Not many. You don't go to the different rides and 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 pay and pay and pay and pay. Jesus did it once and for all. And it's completed. And he can sit at the right hand of God and intercede for you and I. And, and what is he interceding for? And what is he doing in our lives? By the Holy Spirit, he's drawing us nearer to God as we allow him to work in our lives. It isn't always easy to let God work. We need to stop and say, Lord, here I am today. We need to come and bring ourselves in prayer. We read it in the responsive reading. We need to pray without ceasing. Well, does that mean you, you close your eyes down the highway at 65 miles an hour and just, okay, have me, boom, have a crash? No. You don't have to close your eyes when you pray anyways. You, Jesus was stood looking up to heaven many times. But you pray and you're working, you're talking to the Lord. I had somebody the other day said, you must have money in the bank. And I said, why? And they said, because I hear you talking to yourself. I said, well, yeah, I'm supposed to talk out loud. I do talk out loud. I said, Lord, why? You know, I'll pray out loud. I said, Lord, I, give me the lesson I need to learn here. There's many times where I'm going into a situation, you ought to hear me talk when the phone rings. 
Lord, I don't know who's on the other end of this line. I ask that you be glorified, there be blessing. I do. And sometimes when I'm calling, I pray that prayer. Lord, and you, if you come in earshot of me, you'll think I am and not because I'm praying out loud. I'm saying, Lord, be with me. Be with this whole situation, whatever's going to happen here. May you be glorified. You wouldn't believe it, but in my life, I've had some many amazing phone calls that way. And I've been blessed, and, and, and other people have blessed me. You're taught, especially in my Greek class these days, you're, talk, you're taught to talk out loud anyways because you verbalize and you're using more than just the one sense. You're talking and you're hearing, so you're using two and three senses. And it helps you memorize and it helps you remember things. And when I talk to God, I just say, Lord, I need help right now. One of the things that I think are terrible, and in, 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 uh, talking a few minutes ago with somebody about a refrigerator, I, I think it's terrible when you put something in the refrigerator and you don't know it's there for 20 more years. I do, I do. This is a true story. There was a woman, I think it was in Utah, I don't remember, and they had to call the police because, and the hazmat team because she attempted, she found a refrigerator at a job site or something, and she went to clean it out. And they had to get the hazmat team in because the stuff in the refrigerator was toxic. It had been in there so long. It was toxic. But the refrigerator wasn't meant for that, was it? But the problem is that when you go to the refrigerator, you've got to take stock of what's in there. That's what we need to do in our spiritual lives. Because God has made us working when we plug in because unless you plug in, you're not going to get the power that the refrigerator was made for, the power that we were made for as people. And Jesus is interceding for us, but we need to be plugged into him through prayer. And when we plug into him, we're now working. But we've got to see what's inside. And we've got to take stock of things inside, because sometimes we put something in there that shouldn't be. And those things that maybe shouldn't be, when they spoil, they become toxic. So many times in churches all my life, I, I've, I've, I've watched as the, the root of bitterness gets on the front lawn and like dandelions, gets deeper and travels, gets deeper and travels. And maybe you'll go up and rip that all up and rip the lawn up and reseed it and get it in what you thought was, but one little root of that bitterness stayed in there, and it resurfaces. Paul preaches against it. Peter preaches against it. It's the root of bitterness. You don't want that in the refrigerator of your life. And we need to allow Jesus, as he's interceding, that God's Holy Spirit's in us, giving us the opportunity to take inventory. Have you ever held a grudge? Not want to let it go? How do you come before the altar and want God's work in your life and you haven't cleansed that away? Lord, take it. Take it. Take it. Please take it. Give it away. Because it's spoiling inside of you. It's spoiling inside of that refrigerator. It's becoming toxic. I heard a wonderful testimony yesterday from a young man who had the opportunity to maybe do something he shouldn't have. And he said no one else was around, and for days the temptation was there. And he'd think about going down here and taking care of something, but as soon as he took care of that, the thought come back to him. And he said, no matter what I did, that thought kept coming back. Go do your thing. Go do what you want to do. And so many of us do that in our Christian life. When we need to be glorifying the Lord and, and holding Christ up, we want to do our own thing. We want to tell somebody off. You know, she makes me sick. You know, I want to, and the next time I see her, you know, I'll just, I'm a Christian. And even though I want to punch her in the nose, I won't punch her in the nose, but I'll tell you, that's not right. Because what's spoiling inside of us is our heart. And Jesus said, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Let it go. It's poison. 
In fact, sometimes things get freezer burned. They're stale. Is your prayer life stale? Do you pray? Do you pray without ceasing? And, and listen, as the pastor, I, I don't have a corner on any market. It's not easy. I'm, I'm here to tell you when you, you know, this year I've, I'm doing three classes now. You talk about my head feeling like it's in the clouds. And in fact, in one of my textbooks, in the Greek textbook, it says, are you in the cloud yet? And that's the writer of the textbook. He says, don't worry, you'll get out of the fog. I said, no, I won't. I said, I, I see nothing but fog right now. And he, that's the word he uses, fog. We get so busy in our lives taking care of children and issues and running to doctors and having appointments and filling prescriptions. And life isn't easy, I know. But the more we give to him, the more we allow him to be in control, the more we can do that. Exhale. I love that bumper sticker that says, if God is your co-pilot, you should move seats. Let him fly the plane. You can't. You don't know how. I don't know how to fly my life, but he does. He says in John 10, 10, I've come that you might have life full and abundant. And if you don't believe that I struggle in my life, ask my wife. I sit there, oh, Debbie, I need help with this paper. <laughs> Oh, Debbie, I don't have this schedule. Oh, Debbie, I don't have that. And sometimes we used to make a joke out of it. We call it the bobby pins are flying. I had a secretary years ago when I worked in the transportation business. She happens to be related to somebody here. <coughs> I won't mention, um, well, I won't mention the Mitchells. Anyways, so she, she said, but she was a lovely, lovely girl. And every time you gave her something on her desk, if she didn't know what it was about, what am I going to do with this? And we used to tease her. we say, well, there goes the bobby pins. They're flying. Well, it became such a funny anecdote that we bought her a, a, a beautiful fleece sweatshirt for Christmas. And we had it embroidered. And on the front, there was pictures of little bobby pins flying. And on the back, they were flying. And the question on the front was, are they in or are they out? Where's the bobby pins? They're flying. And some of us do that in our lives. When, when, when something comes along, it's a bit of a problem. Oh, what am I going to do? Give it to Jesus. Oh, how am I going to handle this? Give it to Jesus. Because he's going to handle it, and that's what he's doing for us. He allows us to clean up the things that are freezer burned and rotten and spoiled inside the refrigerator of our lives. What's 1 Corinthians 11.28 say? I'm going to take you to another scripture. You don't have to turn. I'm going to give it to you. When we have communion, we come to this table. And I read it last time we had communion together. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. This is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. And in the church at Corinth, they weren't doing spiritual inventory of their refrigerators. They were living life whatever way, which way they wanted to. And when they came to this table, they came to worship like it was okay. Like there was no problem in their lives and like they hadn't sinned and they didn't examine themselves and say, Lord, forgive me. So my mother was a stubborn woman and there's times when if, if I thought she had done something I didn't like, I, and, and I knew I had to go apologize. I didn't want to apologize because I said, Mom's just as wrong as I am. Well, the apple don't fall far from the tree, huh? If I thought she was stubborn, who's being stubborn? And that's our attitude sometimes with God. David was like that. David lamented against God. Why? He said when the, when the priest fell. He was just trying to grab the ark. Why? We all do. There's none of us that are perfect. And that's why we need Jesus to work in our lives. That's why we need God's help. Because he is greater than we are. He created us. Jeremiah says that you knew me when you knitted me together in my mother's womb. Can you imagine that? God saw us before any of this existed. 
God, the eternal God, knew that we'd be sitting here right now, and he's even listening to us. Even angels are listening to us. Because if his Holy Spirit's speaking to you right now, Peter the Apostle says that angels are looking in, trying to figure out how salvation works. Because God hasn't truly revealed it to them yet. And they're servants, and they're looking in. Angels long to look into these things, the scriptures say. Because God's Holy Spirit works in us in ways we don't understand. You ever had a lonely moment? And you put your arms out. And you said, Lord, help me. And all of a sudden, tranquility come over you. I use that story about the time the kids spit in my cup. When I was drinking that coffee at Job Corps, and the last student, when I let him off my little van, told me that the kids, when I had got out of the van for a minute and the van was loaded, they had taken my cup of coffee to the back of the van and then passed it back up. And when I looked at my cup, there was a lump of something in there, and I just... And my first inclination was to go back to each house and if not throttle <laughs> a young person. And I stopped and I sat behind the wheel and I said, Lord, I can't handle this right now because inside my heart's a volcano and it's getting ready to blow. I give this situation to you. And then all of a sudden, a peace that passes understanding came over me. And a calm. And I said, it's all right. It's okay. And I went back and reported it and did the things I was supposed to do. And the, they found that there was two students that had done it. And the center director of the program called me in and he says, there's their records. The government will not allow you to look at them, but he says, I'm doing it because the state law in the state of Maine calls what they did a violation of your rights, and actually it's aggravated attack, an assault, according to the state law. He said, look in those files. I've already had our medical staff look to see if either one of those students is sick. And I said, no, I don't want to see him. Because I would not be worth the salt that I'm made up of when I stand up on Sunday morning and preach God's word if I'm going to take out my vengeance. If I want my retribution. And I said, whatever you see right by your law, it's up to you. I have no control over that. But as far as me, I forgive them. And he looked at me. Actually, it built a relationship with him and I, and we were able to become very close to that center director. The irony for me was one of the boys had been in my boys' brigade. And I had tried to witness to them of Christ a few years before. You see, we don't know what's going to happen in this life, so where do we go to him who knows? To Jesus. In our review this morning, and I want to go on, I'm going to ask you another question. What word is in to indicate Christ's present work as priest? What word is used to indicate Christ's work at peace? And I'll take you to the, the third verse, excuse me, the second verse, chapter 8, back to Hebrews 8, chapter 2. And who serves in the sanctuary and true tabernacle set up by the Lord? If you're using a modern King James or an ESV or another version, it may say minister. He who ministers, and Jesus is ministering. I like the NIV here because it says serves. Many people don't understand what ministering means. And it says he's serving. He's serving as a priest would do on our behalf, the behalf of you and me. And when, when I have a problem and I come to him and I call out on our Father, Jesus is there on my behalf, interceding and saying, this is why. My blood. This is why. Because of me, the high priest, for my behalf, because of what Christ did on the cross, he has that authority to come before the Father and intercede for you and for me. 
You put your name there. He takes care of Linda. He's taking care of Butch. He's taking care of Jane. He's taking care of George. He's taking care of Tina. He's taking care of all of us. If we've given him all, he's there on our behalf. And, and I don't know how you can translate that in your mind, but if you don't see that picture that in heaven on your behalf, Jesus is there this very moment interceding for you. What an awesome thought. Who am I? I've often told people, especially people that I've witnessed to, if you've met me and forgot me, you've, you've lost nothing. If I disappeared tomorrow and five years down the road you forgot who I was, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have lost a thing. But if you meet Jesus and forget him, you've lost everything lost everything. In this paragraph, uh, the writer is explaining to us the marvelous truth that Jesus Christ today ministers in the heavenly sanctuary. This heavenly sanctuary, not the one on earth. And the reason for this discussion is not difficult to determine. His readers, the readers of this Hebrews, like you and I are listening today, his readers knew that there was a real temple in Jerusalem and that in the temple there were priests offering gifts and sacrifices every day. And remember, we've talked about it. That priest had to offer up for their own sins. I prayed it this morning. Father, forgive us our sins. Forgive this preacher his sins. As my attitude is not perfect. And I know there's times I slip and fall and stub my toe. So I pray for me that as I pray for you that God would by his Holy Spirit, correct us and teach us and admonish us in his love. And that's what was going on here. How easy it would be for those people back then, and even for us today, to go back to what we had before. Remember the children of Israel said, let's go back. Why'd you drag us out here in the desert for? We had leeks and honey, and we were living in Goshen. Goshen was a pretty cool place to live. And you drug us out here to die and to starve. To die of thirst, no water? Boys, I, you know, I, I, I understand Moses when he smoked the rock. If you've ever been in ministry, you understand Moses when he smoked the rock. He was just, God, his word called them stiff-necked people. We're people. That's the problem with the church. We're people, and we get in our own way. And sometimes some of us are so aggravating we can't live with ourselves. I had a knot like that. She was unhappy about everything. Was unhappy about who she was. But that's not life, and that's what that's not what he created us for. He created us with a purpose, and that purpose was to know him and to enjoy him fully. How has anyone actually seen Christ working on our behalf? How do we know? Because we see the fruit in our lives. We see what God has done for us. We see in every day what we go through, how God answers our prayers. When Christ came, it said in Hebrews 9:11, and you don't have to turn near, but when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect temple that is not made with human hands. That's the heavenly temple. That is to say, is not a part of this creation. And what did Jesus have to offer? This is what he had to offer for you and for me. And this morning, as we prepare to leave, this is what I want you to think about. Paul told to the church in Ephesus these words. And walk in the way of love, Ephesians 5, 2. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. What does it mean for you and me today to live according to the book of Hebrews? It means to put Christ first and to walk in God's love. The love that we see hang itself from a cross. The love who endured the shame, scorning it for you and for me. I, I love you all, each and every one of you. As I know you, I love you. 
I don't know if I'd die for you. And I'm being honest. And I don't know if you'd die for me. That was the love of God, that Jesus was willing to die for each and every one of us, despite who we are. At Baptist Park, when I was the director there, we used to have a banner up over the platform, and I love that banner. If I had been the only one, he still would have died for me. Think about that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word. Father, we thank you for this rich book of Hebrews. This book that runs us to Jesus, that lets us see power in the name of Jesus. That lets us see healing in the name of Jesus. That lets us see new life in Jesus. Heavenly Father, as we look at it this morning, allow us to examine our hearts and our minds so that we would walk closer to our high priest. And that we would be at one with you. Father, this morning, thank you for your grace. Thank you for all that you give us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord the Christ. Amen.